And so to first approximation, the naive idea of flux quantization or charge, direct charge quantization would just be to say, the Faraday tensor two form of the electromagnetic field has to be such that its image in the ramp cohomology actually coincides with the image of an integral cohomology class. That just means it's flux through spheres. It's total integral over spheres is an integer. But in the, in the spirit of gauge theory, we should not actually impose just an equality between these classes. What we should rather do is say that there's a gauge transformation between F2 and chi in a suitable um, space where they both exist. And that's what we're going to do. And that's going to give the actual electromagnetic field. In order to uh, motivate this, observe that um, the integral cohomology of a, of a compact uh, space has a classifying space. In this case, they were looking at degree two integral cohomology. This classifying, one of the names of this classifying space, it has several names that I'm listing here on the left. It's known as a KZ2 or BO1 or POH or CP infinity. But let's look at BO1. That's the most suggestive incarnation of this space for the purpose of, of electromagnetism. So there's a space which is kind of defined by the fact that it classifies U1 principal bundles so that continuous maps out of a manifold into it are in bijective homotopy classes of them are in bijective correspondence to isomorphism classes of U1 principal bundles. And um, the, the integral cohomology happens to be the connected components of the space of these maps. So this, this just means that actually every equivalence class, isomorphism class of U1 principal bundle is actually classified in turn by an integral cohomology class in degree two called its first churn class. But the point I'm, the point I'm highlighting here is that what we call cohomology is actually a whole space a priori of moduli, if you wish, topological moduli of what this topological field should be. And then we take just this connected components. Pi zero is just a set of connected components of this space. So if we, if we forget all the structure in this space when we form the cohomology and remember just what are its disjoint connected components. And that gives us a first idea of notion of gauge transformations because we see in this mapping space, we can regard each map from X to BU1 as being kind of a topological field component of the electromagnetic field, which um, is going to be the component that kind of classifies the instanton sector, if you wish, the charge sector. This is mapped to be a one. But then um, there's also there's also paths. So homotopy paths in this mapping space. So homotopies between these maps, continuous paths, that continuously deform one such topological field configuration to the other. And in informing the cohomology set, we identify them all, but sort of S topological field configurations, they are distinct, but gauge equivalent. Here's one field configuration, here's another one, and they're homotopic. So using that freedom, we can, of, of having kind of topological gauge transformations, we can boost this equality to an actual gauge transformation. And maybe in order to appreciate this, we need to know, um, let's see, do I actually need this? No, I can skip over this, I think, for the purpose here. Um, so instead of just, instead of mapping um, F2 to its um, to its Durham cohomology class, we, we, there's a way, it turns out, to regard it as, to turn it into one such, into such a map to um, the, oh yeah, that's what I needed this for. Um, sorry, maybe I'm, I'm not, uh, so let, let me put it this way. So there is a way to take the differential two form here and this, um, this charge sector chi and say they need not be equal in cohomology, but they can be transformed into each other in a, in a suitable context, in real cohomology, as it were, in the, in the modular space of real cohomology. We can make them isomorphic there. And a non-trivial uh, statement um, which really I haven't explained at this point, is that this extra freedom of deforming these two pieces of data, the integral global piece of data and the local differential form piece of data into each other, that really is, um, turns out to be equivalently the gauge potential in the electromagnetic field. So that if we form the space of these triples here, um, maybe I can show this here, the space of these triples of data, the Faraday um, flux density, the total 
um, magnetic electromagnetic charge in our spacetime and this way of relating the two, we, we get a new set called the differential cohomology in degree two of our manifold X, which is the home of these uh, gauge potentials and which projects to both the just plane integral cohomology and the differential forms such that given such a uh, potential, we can recover these two things that it's relating. And um, the, the inside of Dirac charge polarization is really that this is the full incarnation of the electromagnetic field in that if, if you have this object, this differential cohomology refining these two pieces of data, you can make, so in physics, I would say we can cancel the anomaly in the um, Lorentz force coupling of, an, of a charged particle to this electromagnetic field. So we can make global sense of um, the, the exponential integral of this, what would locally be a one form around um, a closed trajectory of say an electron in our space time, which otherwise, if you just have, uh, if you don't have this kind of refined data would actually be um, ambiguous. So, so this is a general principle now known for a long time of how to bring in non-perturbative field components into um, gauge fields that are given by differential flux densities, differential form flux densities, that one specifies a, um, an integral class and matches it to the differential form data. And the point now is that this construction is just a special case of a very general construction that um, applies generally. And I'm gonna show a big table now to to show how one um, encounters higher versions of this situation, first in cases that are kind of known, and then in new cases that we care about. So, so this table is supposed to show now in the first column, um, the Maxwell theory that we just looked at in its flux quantization. Oh, sorry, in this column here, this will be the general case, the, the A field of Maxwell theory. And we wanna look at the analogous situation now for what in string theory is called the B field and the RR field. And then what in M theory on 11 dimensional supergravity is the C field, which are higher dimensional, higher degree form analogs, if you wish, of this Maxwell field. And we'll see as we proceed um, through this um, process of flux quantizing the Maxwell field here, we'll see this um, analogous choices to be done for the R field and then for the C field. And, um, and that will lead to this hypothesis of what the correct flux quantization for the C field might be. So in general, when talking about high gauge theories, um, at the flux level, we are dealing with a set of differential forms um, that, that measure fluxes through surfaces or through higher dimensional hypersurfaces if we are dealing with a higher dimensional gauge theory. So you can abstractly imagine that instead of just having points in 4D, such a higher dimensional gauge theory may have higher dimensional objects that are charged to be called brains then, whose flux will be potentially through higher dimensional spheres that surround them in the corresponding possibly higher dimensional space time. And all of this can be encoded by a bunch of differential forms. So for the case of Maxwell theory, we're dealing with the F2 tensor that we already had. And actually in the formulation that we're using here, that I'm going to use in order to make it really applicable to these higher cases, I'm going to go to what's sometimes called the pre-geometric or duality symmetric form formulation of Maxwell theory, where in fact, I double the field corner and I say, on top of the Faraday tensor, there's actually another two form G2, which in a moment I'll declare to be the Hodge dual of F2 so that actually one determines the other, but it's going to be really important and useful to think of them as being a priori two different or two independent two forms as they actually will be on a Cauchy surface in just a moment. So, so this way of writing Maxwell's equations, which, which usually would just say that df2 equals zero and in vacuum at d star f2 equals zero, we can say df2 is closed is zero and d of g2 is closed, but they're actually Hodge dual. So this formulation, it's easy to, to write down um, the corresponding um, high gauge theory of the B and R fields. So some of you may know this very well. It's just the usual story for those who haven't seen this before can take what I'm saying now as the definition of what one means of by the B field and the R field. It's some higher theory of gauge fields which have fluxes 
of degree three, of degree seven, and in every even degree. So this is for the, the experts in the audience. This is currently for untwisted. Uh, no, sorry, this is, um, no, no, sorry, this is the field content. And um, there is again, these hostility relations. And um, there's some closure conditions, but with some twists now, instead of that all, all forms are just closed, this H and H3 and H7 form, the, the NS flux densities are closed, but these RR field fluxes, the Fs, satisfy this twisted Bianchi identity, saying that, maybe I can make it a bit larger, saying that the differential of the Fs um, is actually some polynomial, and this will be important, it's indicated here, in general, the differentials of these flux forms are polynomial. That's, that's what this P is supposed to indicate of the other flux densities. Here it's a simple binary polynomial saying, um, you wedge this H3 form with a with a FRR flux in two degrees lower. And um, something analogous happens in 11 dimensional supergravity. There's the famous C field, which has flux density in pre geometrically in degree four and degree seven. They're hold stool to each other. And the equations of motion, again, of this. Um, polynomial form that uh, let's say that the G4 flux is actually closed, whereas this G7 flux satisfies this condition, which uh, stands out as being an actual quadratic polynomial here. So it's a nonlinear coupling, self-coupling of this field to itself, which plays a, a permanent role um, in everything that one cares about in this theory. So the point now is that um, we see here that these high gauge theories are all actually at the level of their flux densities, the equations of motions are all entirely defined by polynomial, what we might call polynomial differential relations. We can abstract this. We can say, well, these are phrased in terms of differential forms, but if this theory is defined naturally on all space times, then we just actually have an abstract relation. So I'm just gonna rewrite these Bianchi equations of motion in, in abstract algebraic form. I'm saying, let there be, let us talk about an abstract differential geometric algebra, DG algebra, which is freely generated by a bunch of generators, by a bunch of things that I can wedge together, but which are not differential forms, but just abstract algebra elements, which I'm calling B, and which says, which have a differential defined on them. So, you know, a degree one operator on this algebra to itself, which satisfies the Leibniz rule. It's a graded derivation and um, as such, it's defined on what it does to the generators, and it sends them to some polynomial of the other generators, the same polynomial here. So I'm just repeating the previous equations in this kind of abstracted form. I say, well, when we're faced with Maxwell electromagnetism, we're apparently abstractly dealing with two different things of degree two on which a differential is defined that is zero. In this case, we're, we're dealing with an abstract uh, element in degree three, one in degree seven, one in every even degree, such that the differentials are such and so forth. The point is that this is, an, this is a DG algebra, which I can now use for algebraic descriptions of these actual differential equations. So everything here is, is meant to be very elementary. There's not to be deep or something, but it's going to lead to an actual important um, transparent formulation of what's going on with these high gauge theories and what the actual admissible flux quantization laws should be. So now we can observe, namely, with this DG algebra, this abstract DG algebra in hand, that we can describe the solution space of these, of these uh, Bianchi identities, of these equations of motion, as a homomorphism of DG algebras. Namely, um, consider the DG algebra homomorphisms from these DG algebra CA that I defined here, into the DG algebra of differential forms, the Durham algebra, whose differential is the um, is the Durham differential. Then you can easily see from just from the fact that this is these were defined that a single homomorphism from CA to the differential forms is just an instance of differential fluxes that satisfy their equations of motion. Right, every generator in the CE algebra, every such B of some degree has to be sent under the homomorphism to a corresponding differential form of the same degree that defines the Fs. And then the fact that this homomorphism described, um, respects the differential just means that these differential forms just satisfy their equations of motion. So such a homomorphism from this C algebra that I'm calling CA to uh, differential forms, we can think of in um, 
in the algebraic language as being the single differential form with values in something like a higher Lie algebra that satisfies a flatness condition. So it turns out that um, every such DG algebra that is of this form that its underlying graded algebra is free as a graded algebra, and then only some information is in the differential, such DG algebras are equivalent to, are dual opposites to higher generalizations of Lie algebras called L infinity algebras. So in this case of electromagnetism, we see this in a very um, special example. The, the corresponding higher Lie algebra that corresponds to this electromagnetism is the, um, the algebra of, what I'm writing here, B1, it's shifted U1, it's the Lie2 algebra that like, like the ordinary abelian Lie algebra on the real numbers with vanishing bracket is, um, is a Lie algebra, a higher Lie algebra that has a single copy of R in degree one. So it's shifted up in degree and it's still a, a vanishing bracket, which is reflected in the fact that these differentials are zero. So this relation that I'm indicating here, I'm not, I'm not currently defining. This is something that I ask you to accept. It's also not super important for understanding the next line, it's just to give a perspective on how we have a chance of reformulating um, such differential relations, Bianca identities in higher Lie theoretic form. I'll jump over this case maybe because this doesn't have an established name, but in this in this case of the C field, this, this Lie algebra that is kind of encoded in the corresponding DG algebra that we built here, actually does have a name. It's sometimes called the M theory gauge algebra, or the 11 dimensional supergravity gauge algebra. It's a higher Lie algebra, which in this case actually happens to be an actual graded Lie algebra in, in the sense that it's it satisfies an, act, has an actual bracket, super bracket though with a satisfying a Jacobi identity. So it has two generators, V3 and V6, which you should think of as being, they are the, the gauge generators that correspond to G4 and G7 here, right? There's a degree shift for some technical reasons. And you should think of them as being kind of the, the coefficients of the duals to these abstract flux forms. And the fact that DG7 was the square here of G4 in this dual L infinity algebra picture means that there's a bracket between the corresponding Lie elements here, which makes sense since these are in degree three. So this bracket is actually an anti-bracket, you know, sorry, an odd bracket. So it does not necessarily vanish. In fact, it's equal to V6. But anyway, this was just this algebraic reformulation of these Bianchi identities. Another point is that we, while, while we obtained here some algebraic data, an infinity algebraic data, as it were, the algebraic data from Bianchi identities from high gauge theories, there's another source of such Lie algebras, and that is spaces. It turns out, and again, this is a black box I'm just um, giving you, I, that we would, we would need a lecture to define this in more detail, but it turns out there's an ancient process that takes a topological space indicated by a calligraphic L here and extracts a Lie algebra from it, an L infinity algebra from it, a higher Lie algebra. And, um, and in the case of ordinary electromagnetism, that space whose whitehead bracket Lie algebra, as it's called, um, is of the form that we just saw here, happens to be, um, the, again, our BU1, which now I'm writing as a B2Z, as a KZ2. So the classifying space, sorry, I'm changing notation here from the previous slides. This is not really harmonized. This was, this is the B, this is the same up to a multiple equivalence as the BU1 that we saw arise in Dirac charge quantization. And what this slide or this table is, is trying to show here is that an abstract way of understanding why that space was a valid choice for charge quantization and electromagnetism is that there is a way to associate an L infinity algebra with it, which just happens to be the same, that L infinity algebra happens to be the same L infinity algebra that we extracted as the characteristic L infinity algebra of the equations of motion. So in this, in this column here, this is a this is kind of um, electromagnetism made, made difficult, if you wish. We understood this easier before without talking about L infinity algebras, but the point is once we phrased it this way with the L infinity algebras, it now makes sense more generally. So we found an L infinity algebra, or I claimed with it, for the RR fields. And now we can ask, is there a space that has that L infinity algebra as its whitehead L infinity algebra? And just turns out by some actually basic arguments in rational homotopy theory, which however I'm not currently showing, that the space of, that does have this property, so there are very many of them, but one of them 
is known by the name, the homotopy quotient of the, there's a typo here, this should be a, a one. There's the homotopy quotient of the classifying space of complex topological K theory by, um, by B, oh no, it's correct actually, by B U one, yeah, by B two Z. It's by, so this thing is actually a higher group, this classifying space turns out to itself have a group structure, which makes it a, a two group if you realize it as a, anyway, so the one, there's some space here, I haven't described it anyway, so I don't need to um, bother about details. The point is just, you form, you compute the whited L infinity algebra of this space, you form, find the same L infinity algebra that characterizes the equations of motions of the RR field. And of course, it's a famous conjecture that RR fields are quantized, flux quantized in K-theory. And what I'm claiming here is that even though this wasn't how it was historically defined, that the kind of systematic way of understanding is this fact that K-theory is a valid flux quantization law for the RR fields, like integral cohomology was a valid flux quantization law for the Maxwell field, it's due to the fact that the classifying space of K-theory happens with the same whited L infinity algebra is the characteristic L infinity algebra of these equations of motions. And now finally, doing the same thing for the C field it actually becomes simpler in a way. With this space is, if you haven't seen these kinds of things before, it's hard to understand. But for the C field, even though we had these kind of more fancy equations, which had a genuine non-linearity in them, turns out this M theory or supergravity um, gauge Lee algebra happens to be very well known since the 70s, well known as the Whitehead L infinity algebra of a space. And that space is just a four sphere, just a four dimensional sphere. So seeing this, one can then one can then say, well, so in forming this Whitehead L infinity algebra of a space, we're losing a lot of information of this space. So there are lots of many different spaces that have the same Whitehead L infinity algebra. Namely, the white L infinity algebra re recalls everything that is non-torsion about the corresponding cohomology theory. So it forgets lots of information. So if we now want to say that one of these spaces here actually is the one that in some sense is responsible for the actual quantization of the charges and the fluxes in our theory, we need to make a choice. But there's always, at least in all known examples, there's always kind of a canonical choice. Like it was the choice that I've actually already given here. You can conjecture that, and it's still kind of a conjecture, even though you could argue for Maxwell theory, it has been experimentally proven, even though um, monopoles have not been detected. Anyway, so you can go and say, well, probably that is the non-perturbative piece of the field content of Maxwell theory. It's uh, given by maps into this classifying space. And we saw on the previous slide, that's what happens. In K-theory, if you go and say that these are R fields, excuse me, that these are R fields should have a flux quantization law in the actual classifying space, which is KU0 mod BZ2. That is saying that they should be classified in K theory. And that is a famous conjecture, which I'm calling hypothesis K here in order to amplify that this is a hypothesis that would need to be and has not been fully proven, but it's widely uh, thought to be very plausible. And lots of people are working on under the assumption that this is the case but uh, there's actually things uh, to be proven. In particular, there are other choices here. Anyway, since um, since the 90s, I guess that's a famous conjecture in string theory that this is what's actually going on in the non-perturbative sector of the R field, that the R field is actually in twisted K theory of which this here is the classifying space. Now the upshot is once we see this pattern here, we cannot do the same thing for the C field here and say, well, probably since it so happened that the smallest in the, in the sense of numbers of CW complex cells. The smallest space, which has the same characteristic L infinity algebra that characterizes the equation, the Bianca identities of the C field. Since that space is the four sphere, then possibly that is the classifying space for the non-perturbative completion of the C field. And this is what we call hypothesis H because the cohomology theory that is classified by S4 in the same, by the space, in the same sense that these spaces classify in ordinary cohomology and twisted K theory, that cohomology theory is known as unstable cohomotopy. Because homotopy is something where you map out of spheres, homotopy groups, something you map out of spheres. And here we're mapping into the sphere regarding as a classifying space. So hypothesis H in, in 11 dimensional supergravity is the conjecture directly analogous to this conjecture about hypothesis K, uh, this uh, conjecture about R fields. 
which in direct analogy to how here we're saying the RF axis should be in K theory, he was saying the C field should be quantized in chromotopy. And um, the by by analogy with the previous um, slide where we said, okay, once you have the fluxes, the flux densities, and their charge quantization law, the actual field is kind of that datum which connects these two pieces of data, which deforms the fluxes into the character of the charge um, uh, of the charge sectors. So that full field content, which technically is the homotopy fiber product of the fluxes with these maps over their real part. So I, I mentioned before that for the ordinary Maxwell field, the collection of this data is called the ordinary differential cohomology in degree two. That's where the that's where the actual gauge potential of electromagnetism lives. For K theory, it's called differential K th differential twisted K theory. And in general, it's called the, the differential such and such, the differential A cohomology. So, so the conjecture means that the actual C field, like the actual gauge potentials that have these fluxes, the actual fields that the physicists would write down as C3 and C6 are actually um, elements in differential cohomotopy. So that is um, a new assumption about what's going on with the C field. And um, I'm going to next show that with this assumption, we um, we find a lot of interesting structure. Um, but you know, maybe before I go to this, let me just keep this up and ask for questions. So at this point, I haven't really explained how many of these things work. Just threw them at you. But let's see if there's any questions. Maybe. Nevertheless, well, or I do have we... one, one, one question. Yes, please. Uh, in in the way that you have phrased hypothesis H, you're of course uh, it, it's been motivated by looking at all the structures above, including the, the fluxes, the characteristic and the algebra, etc. Do you see a way, uh, uh, auto, as, as an alternative, do you see a way to understand in what sense hypothesis K might be subsumed by hypothesis H just by looking at it at the level of the classifying space? So for, is there a way to see that this, the K theoretic setup is somehow, uh, can, can be extracted from S4? Yeah, absolutely. No, absolutely. That's one of the, I was going to show the first consistency checks of this, but this is of course uh, one, I just had it on the board here. Should we try it? Because I don't have this on the slide currently, maybe. Should we okay, try if I can draw it on the board? You'll have to unshare because- uh, you'll Oh, I see. Screen. You'll have to unshare it and then we might be able to. You know, let's, let's try this. Okay, now I see myself. So yeah. Um, so for, for the people in the audience, you'll have to go on the speaker's view rather than the gallery. So just let's try this just very briefly. So um, one of the first checks we did, this is from the article, I think, um, sphere value super cycles in M theory. Um, we'll make the following observation. So the idea is roughly, I mean, I haven't actually presented the twisting yet, but suppose our space times are essentially flat, then, um, then, then the hypothesis says that, the, can you see this here? It yes. says that the charge sector on, a, on an 11 dimensional space time, the charge sector of the C field should be mapped to S4. The full hypothesis actually has a gravitational twisting of this. So this is just maybe, let's think of this as being essentially a bunch of tori here, then this is accurate. But now we wanna ask, how does this relate to hypothesis K, which is supposed to apply to 10 dimensional space times which are um, basis of circle vibrations of um, uh, uh, under under this eleven dimensional space. Time. So let's look at the simple case to to make it easier. Of course, we don't have to make this assumption. I'm just I'm just making it for uh, for ease of presentation. Let's assume, if you can see this here, that my eleven dimensional space time actually was, as is often assumed, just the product of a circle factor, the famous M theory circle with x ten. So then one can one can see in a simple argument by it's the same uh, the same mapping space adjunction that I already used previously maps from this product into here are the same thing as maps out of this space with values in maps out of S1. We're just changing the order in which we're applying the variables. So this is actually the same as, let's see, can you see this here? Uh, let's yeah. see, I should move away. <laughs> like so, maps from S1 to, to, to S4. But this is, of course, 
This is, of course, the free loop space of S4, right? Mm -hmm. And so, so for hypothesis H here to be reasonable, it should be that, so it predicts actually, it predicts actually that in, in 10D, the charge quantization law should be classified by the free loop space of S4 instead of by K-theory. So you might say, okay, the, the hypothesis is dead in the water. It, this has no chance to being anything like K-theory. And the interesting thing now, it actually is uh, a truncated form of K-theory. This was uh, an insight by Hisham Sati that, um, that led to this article. I think it's sphere value super cost cycles. Namely, one works out now, what is, let's see if I can, let me move, let me move to here. Can see this? So one, so in order to, to see which fluxes we're um, describing now in this theory, we have to work out the chevalier eilenberg algebra of the Whitehead L infinity algebra of the loop space of S4. So it, it seems like a mouthful, but it turns out this is actually something one can glean from this standard, but has to work a little bit, but the results are uh, standard results in the rational homotopy theory literature. And one finds that this algebra is given as follows. It has, it has a generator um, in degree two, which I'm already writing. Let's see, can you can you see this? So I'm already so there's a there's gonna be a flux. Instead of writing B2, I write F2, it's easier to, to see, right? I'm just I'm just need to write a bunch of degree flux generators and then what the differentials are. So this is is closed. And then it has another it has another generator F4. Oh, well, and it sh I should say it has a it has a generator H3, which is okay. Let's maybe I should do this first. Let, let me start again. It has a generator H3, which is closed. Then it has a generator F2, which is closed. Then it has a generator F4, which is not closed, but satisfies the 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 twisted relation known from K theory, and it has a generator F6 which similarly is of the form H3 wedge F4. Okay, so this is the beginning of the chevalier eilenberg algebra of that homotopy quotient of the classifying space of KU by B to Z, but it actually stops here. So it's a truncated form of this K theory. For those in the know, this actually sees exactly those uh, D brains that actually that actually do are obtained as compactifications of the M2 and M5. And then it has one more generator, H7, which um which has a, a differential relation that is known. There's no doubt by Kramer and Julia where they work this out, but it's not as widely known. But this is the um correct Bianca identity of the um, NS5. So it goes F2 which F4 plus I hope I get the prefix right. There's a one half here. I think it's here, F4. Um, um, sorry, F6 and F4, which F4. So this is another nonlinear part. So the, the point is that the beginning here looks just, it's just the correct um, differential relations for the RR fields, only that um, F8 um, is missing, which is, which is of course the one that is not obtained actually by the measure reduction from um, 11 measure supergravity. So um, we have we have this one article called Gauge Enhancement from uh, Hypothesis H or something, something with Gauge Enhancement in the title, where we, we talk about how um, how what mechanism would enhance this structure to full K theory down here. But this is what, what one gets directly. And it is, um, it is um, interestingly, exact, exactly the field content that actually follows from 11D if um, you include Right, if you include in K theory the the other forms which are not here, for instance F zero and F eight, you're actually getting into deep waters because, for instance, if you include F zero, you're talking about massive um, type two A, which does not directly follow from eleven D, similar for the other piece. So this is the the piece that kind of actually follows from the suspected M theory, and then is actually reproduced um, uh, from from this hypothesis H. So this um, this leads me back. Maybe I reshare my screen now. This leads me back to the um, insistence on writing these hypotheses everywhere. So um, we're kind of careful of 
careful of calling this assumption that S4 is the right coefficient the hypothesis because it's an assumption about the non perturbable field content of the theory, which may or may not be correct in whatever sense of correct. It may not, not be what one is after or what will work in the end because we're increasing the field content here. But I do want to amplify that the same kind of assumptions are actually hidden in these, even in Dirac's hypothesis, even though they have been sociologically established, but the choice of this space here is not unique. There are many, many spaces in general that have the same flux quantization. And which one of these is actually the correct one, for instance, which one of these is actually compatible with the idea that M theory should be dual to type 2A is, uh, is something that um, will need to be checked and has not um, in the literature usually been checked. But anyway, yeah, so that was my answer to this question. <laughs> All right, thank you. Uh, I think there's a question uh, from David. David, go ahead. Yeah, I was gonna, so it, you could recover that. F8. David, you might have to come closer to the microphone. You couldn't recover that F8. I was wondering if that relates to the fact that the M theory super algebra doesn't uh, actually contain all of the other super algebras for all the other string theories. So maybe I was, my question is, do you think you could get it by going to say D equals 11 plus three? Yeah, that's a good question. That, that might be. In this article gauge enhancement, we propose another um, uh, mechanism. We, we, we say, we say maybe the way to think about it is type 2a is actually not just the reduction of the m theory but a linearized version of that and if you do if you do what i'm showing here for the full situation of when you start with the twist you can do a fiberwise linearization and then in fact f8 does appear so there's um there's there's ways to bring in f8 we haven't i haven't thought about um starting from higher dimension I, i'm not sure about why do you say plus three so i guess i would have I would have checked maybe 12 dimensional supergravity. There's a there's a version of this, but yeah, so I don't have a conclusive answer to uh, to this. It was just shown that that dimension can unify all of the other super algebras. Oh, I see, I see. Yeah, that might be, maybe. So I don't know, I don't know. But that, yeah, sounds like a good idea, actually. If that's the case, yeah. You know, let me, since, since we're already talking about um, loose ends now before before we talk about too much about loose ends let me actually show you some of the things um that are known and that work so there you get a sense of how non-crazy this actually is right so so one point of this slide was meant to be to to show that um this hypothesis h is not an outlandish hypothesis once you have this pattern here you know it may be right it may be wrong but it's not it's something you want to check the same with hypothesis k actually once you see this pattern that every high gauge theory you know, has these things, you say, well, that's that's a possible flux quantization law, so check this. And here, the reason why this hasn't previously been um, discussed this way is that this character map that I'm using here in, in order to go from a space to the L infinity algebra, that was only known for abelian theories. So this actually counts still as an abelian theory, even though it has this non-abelian piece here, but you can absorb this in the twist and becomes twisted abelian. This, wasn't known until recently. We wrote this book called The Character Map and Non-Abelian Comology, recently published by World Scientific, to point out that the same construction also works for so-called non-abelian comology theories like cohomotopy. And then once you know this, you say, well, okay, it can only be S4 or some attachment of cells to S4 that don't change its, its rational homotopy type. So you want to check if it's not S4, it must be some variant of S4. And so in any case, it's something that deserves checking. That was the point here. But then it does look, it does look like just S4 gets at least awfully close to the correct answer because it, it turns out to know a whole lot of subtle stuff about M theory. And I'm just showing here the most basic ones. Let me scroll a bit. So here's just a, a recap of this, this picture which I, which I didn't really explain anyway, how, how the full field content is now the of C uh, fields would be the fluxes and the charge sector embodied in a map to S4 and some way of relating them, which gives the gauge potentials. So that we have differential cohomotopy. And notice as a first, as a first, as the very first zero, zeroth, but still kind of interesting consistency check that we see the right solitons. So remember how the, with the, how in direct, in direct charge quantization, how did we see that the, um, that the magnetic monopole now had, um, 
possibly integral charge. Well, the space time it was defined was the complement of the monopole world line, which was homotopy equivalent to a sphere, and maps from the two sphere to the classifying space B U one, since it was a KZ two, happened to be um, in bijection to the integers. So the second homotopy group of KZ two was Z. That's how the Z charges of the monopole appears. So we can do the same now here with this assumption that our classifying space is now the four sphere. <laughs> But now we we need to put in the corresponding dimensions. So we're in 11D space time, 10 comma one dimensional Minkowski space time. And now we want to take out, say, the the world volume of an idealized um, flat five brain, which is R5 comma one. That um, that complement is now. So if you work it out directly, it's it's the world volume of the M5 uh, times the radial direction times what's now a four sphere around the five brain in 11D. So since, since these two factors here are contractible, they are not seen by homotopy class of maps. Contractible pieces drop out. So the, the four homotopy of this space is just the same as that of the four sphere. It's just the only non-trivial, topologically non-trivial piece in this space time. But now remember this was defined as maps from S4 to S4. And this is of course also the same thing as just the homotopy group with a lowercase four now. So that's why the you know, this is uppercase, it's kind of in a way dual. Here we're mapping out of a sphere, here we're mapping into a sphere, but since in this case, the dimensions of the sphere are the same, we can just exchange them just for purposes of computation. And we see, okay, the cohomotopical charge of a, five, of a, of a singular five brain uh, is the fourth, uh, takes values in the fourth homotopy group of the four sphere, which is of course the integers. It's again, the, the, wrap, the wrapping number of S4 over itself. So we discover, the integer number of five brains under this hypothesis, which is kind of the right answer if we want to charge quantize. So this means we have quantized the charge of the five brain in this sense. So you might say, well, that's maybe not too surprising because you just took you just took the transverse sphere of the brain as your classifying space. So of course it was the integers. And that is true. So at this level, this would work for any brain. But now the thing is, the interesting thing is that S4 also knows just exactly about the M2 brains, which is meant to be exactly the other fundamental brain in M theory, where the argument now goes the same. We have R10 comma one. Now we take out the world volume of a singular M2. We get two contractible factors and now the transverse sphere around the M2 is a seven sphere. So we're not, um, hypothesis H now predicts that the corresponding charges take values in the fourth cohomotopy of the seven sphere, which is the seventh homotopy group of the four sphere. And that is non-torsion. It has a, a Z factor, which is represented, its generator is represented by the famous quaternionic Hopf vibration. There's a topologically non-trivial map from S7 to S4, which is the higher dimensional analog of the more famous Hopf vibration from S3 to S2. And it generates an integer worth of um, charges here. So in this way, using S4 and 4 cohomotopy as the coefficients directly knows that there is both uh, magnetic and electric M2 and 5 brain charges that are both quantized in the integers. So that's the first check. Then more sophisticated, but now I'm using more technology that I, that I haven't explained. So I'd mentioned before that um, just maps to S4 is not actually gonna be the right answer. The, the way to understand in general, uh, there's a twist to this story. And the way to understand this is that passing from plane cohomology to twisted cohomology, let's look at K-theory first, is a way of encoding the coupling to background fields. So the, the RR field that we saw, I should really go back now to the formulas, but maybe we can just remember them. You know, it had the, the RR flux as F and it had the NS flux H3. And the differential relation was actually nonlinear. It said DF is H3. F uh, up to some degrees, but we can think of this as being just a linear relation on the Fs, only that they're twisted by the background uh, H3 flux. Yeah, I'm just claiming that we can do this, but this, this is something we can do. So that the R field, which we understood as a map to this classifying space, which was this homotopy quotient, is really sort of fiberwise a map just to KU, which is just the classifying space for K theory. And there's a twist um, classified by the B field, which itself is as a classifying space um, B2U1, which is a KZ3. 
So this is, remember, maybe for those who know this stuff, that the B field um, can be understood in generalized geometry as actually being part of the gravitational background. So in a sense, this is actually, this twist is actually a coupling of the R field to a part of the gravitation of the generalized gravitational background. In this spirit, we want to couple the C field to its gravitational background. So if we declare that the C field itself is a classifying space S4, we need to find you know, some way of parametrizing S4 vibrations over space-time classified, um, kind of twisted by the tangent bundle. And the, the canonical way of doing this is that you take a group like SO5 that canonically acts on S4 by rotating it. Then if you have an SO5 principle bundle, it, um, it can be used to um, form an S4 spherical vibration by just associating S4 to it via the canonical action of SO5 uh, on S4. Now SO5, since we're on a spin manifold, should be promoted to a spin five. And spin five happens to be equivalent to this um, quaternary group, SP2. And actually in the full theory, we're using some further extension of that group, but let's not worry about this for the moment. So essentially the full hypothesis H on curved, curved backgrounds actually says that the C field is not quite generally just in four chromotopy, but it's actually in a twisted form of four chromotopy with a tangential twist. There's some subtleties here, which I maybe skip over for the moment. So there's some extension of SP2. So it's a tangentially twisted form of chromotopy. You can think of it as there's a bundle of four spheres over space time. And um, at each point, the C field is a map just to the fiber, which is just an S4. But as you move around space time, these S4s twist around, uh, which um, which gives a certain interaction between the C field and the gravitational field. And in this form, and this I think is remarkable, hypothesis H um, does reproduce the famous non-trivial shifted flux organization of the C field. So in famous articles by Edward Witten in, in the 90s, he argued by looking at the partition function of the five brain that if you take the four form flux of that C field, and take its um, the Ram cohomology class that this is not actually in general necessarily an integral class. Remember that was the case for the Faraday tensor two form in two dimensions down in two degrees down. Instead, he argued that um, you should, if only if you sum it up with one half of another integral class that is an integral class of the um, spin of the tangent bundle. So since we are on a spin manifold, it's it's called one half. It's the first fractional quadratic class. Doesn't matter for the moment what exactly it is. It's the point is just that in parentheses here, this is an integral cohomology class, um, a characteristic class of the tangent bundle of space time. And we're supposed to take one half of it in rational cohomology, which then in turn is not in general an integer anymore, but is half integer. And Witten's proposal, or uh, how should one say, argument was that it's this sum that should actually be an integral cohomology instead of, instead of the summons separately. And there was a subtle condition which um, attracted the attention back then of mathematicians. So Hopkins and Singer wrote this article with the famous, famously cool title, uh, Quadratic Functions in uh, M-Theory and Algebraic Topology, uh, motivated by making sense of this kind of structure in generalized cohomology. So they essentially ask, how can we understand, why does this arise? How can we understand this mathematically as something that would arise as a condition characterizing certain cohomology theories on the rational differential form level? And um, they construct something, I would argue they essentially build it in by hand though, because they insist on working, or they, they work with abelian cohomology theories who cannot see these non-trivial twists here. Anyway, long story short, this actually follows from this hypothesis age. Due, due to this tangential twisting, if you work this out, you find that the first fractional Poincaré class is part of this background field, spins um, tangent, you know, gravitational field structure. It's kind of an instanton piece of the gravitational field, and it just comes out. This has to do with the fact, in order to prove this, one looks at the integral cohomology of B spin five, it notices that it generators essentially already form there's a its generators already essentially form this uh, this relation. And then one just has to prove that under pulling them back um, along along such a classifying map, these relations are preserved. 
The other condition that is implied, which so this was this condition was known. It was well, it was expected that it should hold in M theory, but it, it wasn't really known what it should be kind of on more fundamental mathematical grounds. This other condition wasn't even, as far as I'm aware, this was largely ignored. So it's known that the analogous charge of the M2 brain should be this thing called the page charge. I'm multiplying it by two here for reasons that we can go in if we have more time. Um, so so um, just like G4 integrated over a four sphere, would kind of measure how many M5 brains are sitting inside the four sphere. So a general argument going back um, to some article by Page and then others uh, shows that this combination of uh, G7 flux with G4 flux together with another flux that is somewhat subtle in origin here, which is um, kind of the H3 flux on the world volume of an N5 brain. So such a combination should measure if you integrate over the seven spheres, the total number of M2 brains uh, contained in there. And as far as I'm aware, nobody um, promoted an argument for why that would actually be integral as it should be um, in order to have a flux quantization also of M2 brain charge. But that is actually implied. And this is a somewhat non-trivial computation um, that we've done with Domenico and Domenico Fiorenza and Hisham Sati that actually follows from, from this flux quantization law. So these are just the first um, two things that work out, which somehow good indication that something is right about this hypothesis. Okay, so let's see, how are we doing with time? Yeah. So we're way over time already, right? <laughs> um, so I have more, yeah, so what should we do? So maybe maybe I'll, I'll take questions and if, if something triggers another slide, we show another slide, how about that? Uh, sure, let's, if you have one quick slide, let's go with that. So you know maybe uh, since since I suppose the way this this went I'm I'm I was glossing over all details anyway I let's just jump ahead over all kinds of details here and just show you just for impressionistic purposes more uh, more subtle things that come out so I, I showed I showed how some flux quantization laws come out but we're claiming more works so I'm, yeah I don't want to overclaim this I don't want to you know I'm not I'm not sure if if hypothesis H is correct, it might be wrong, but it, it cannot, I think, be wrong by much. So here's, for instance, something rather, uh, I think, unexpected that comes out right. One can go and one has to arrange um, things properly, but, but can go and classify now, for instance, what hypothesis H does to how which which brains in low code dimension it sees. So we, we've seen that the, the, the singular M5 and the singular M2, they appear just in this kind of no, uh, um, head-on way, just we we take out their singular loci from space-time and just measure the charge to this. But there's more, um, there's other notions, there's solitonic notions of brains um, akin to the um, the vortex tubes that uh, one sees in the electromagnetic field, for instance, in type two superconductors. So apart from the magnetic monopoles that the Dirac envisioned might or might not exist. One can actually see the magnetic flux quantization at work, experimentally observe it. If one puts a magnetic field through a planar superconductor, type two superconductor, switching on the magnetic field makes, make, makes lots of vortices appear in the superconductors around which the magnetic flux through the superconductor is concentrated, but it's not singular as it would be for the monopole. It's just as a bump. And then there's another bump for the next uh, vortex. And the experimental effect is that these, well, these vortices are identifiable integer number of vortices called abricots of vortices. And if you look at the theoretical um, derivation of this fact, it comes about by the fact that we're now measuring the electromagnetic field, um, not in a space time where we've taken out a, a singular source, but in a flat space time where we are forcing the fields at infinity to vanish at infinity. And that brings in another effective sphere to us to right, the, the planar superconductor sort of with, it, with its ends and infinity all identified because the field doesn't cease all of infinity as being zero is actually another two sphere. So that the same charge quantization argument of Dirac actually applies also to abricots of vortices in uh, superconductors. And again, shows that there must be uh, a common integer numbers. Um, I told this long story to indicate that the same can and should not be done for M-brains. So we can look at these, I'm, call, I'm calling them solitonic M-brains. Those 
that are not don't have singular field values, but are me- have uh, field values vanishing at infinity, and hence are measured at one point compactifications of space times. And so one has to work a bit and go through this machine, and um, and one can then work out what, for instance, what is the cohomotopical charge on the hypothesis H that is seen for a system <clears throat> that in the string theory literature. <laughs> It's known as intersecting the 68 brains and kind of intersecting on NS5 brains in, as shown in this cartoon here, which is the kind of cartoon you would find in the string theory literature. Kind of imagine a bunch of parallel, the eight brains here, the six brains ending on them and ending with the other end on an NS5. So we can, we built the space time, you know, putting the points at infinity such that it models these brains and then evaluate cohomotopy on it. And it turns out that the corresponding cohomotopy moduli so the mapping space into, into the uh, force sphere that models this comes out being the configuration space. It's homotopy equivalent to the configuration space of points in R3. In R3, if you walk through the dimensions here, R3 is just the transverse dimension, the transverse space that a single such D6 has inside the D8. Right? So the D6 ends on the D8, and if everything is like orthogonal as I'm drawing it here, then it can move in three directions inside the D8, right? The D8 has two more dimensions, but the D6 has one of its directions perpendicular to the D8. So in total, that makes three. And then, <clears throat> so this is this is in the, this is the, <clears throat> sorry, this is the type 2a picture. But since we're really evaluating an M theory, there's another secret circle here, which is just as I had shown it on the board. Uh, everything is actually maps from that circle into whatever other moduli we get. So that we actually get, and this is kind of interesting, the actual moduli of M theory now, are actually the, the loops in this cohomotopical moduli, which is the configuration space. And then um, the corresponding quantum observables, so the quantum observables on such moduli are kind of, you know, they should be like chains on these configurations with some weights. So in the homotopy theory context, we should take the homology of that configuration space. And that homology, since we're in a loop space, there's a very interesting aspect in this story. We find that in general homology, um, you know, with surface classical observables doesn't have a non-commutative loop, it uh, doesn't have a non-commutative algebra structure in it. But in loop spaces, as they do arise from M-theory compactifications, there's a Hopf algebra structure on this homology. And this Hopf algebra turns out, it turns out to be known, this is, the fadel husseini theorem, it says that the homology of this cohomotopical model is actually the, as an algebra, it's the algebra of these chord diagrams, as it's called. It's diagrams of this form with a bunch of strands, which is our D8 brains, really, and a bunch of uh, chords, as they're called, between them, which we'll see corresponds to the D6, same, uh, satisfying some relations. And it turns out these relations that are just algebraically imposed by implied by some classical theorem, they can just be matched one to one. I'm just claiming this now without <laughs> explaining the details, of course. They turn out to be <clears throat> the rules known from Hanani Witten theory of how such brain intersections should behave. For instance, there's a famous S rule that no two such brains should end on the same D8, and all this follows. And then you can compute what the so these are the this is the algebra of quantum observables on our cohomotopically quantized T68 brains. And then you want to know what is the quantum states. So in this general perspective of algebraic quantum field theory, when you know the, the algebra of observables, the quantum states should be um, linear positive functionals on these algebras of, of the observables. Now the linear functionals on algebras of chord diagrams are famously known as weight systems because the idea is that if you have a weight in the form of a, of a Lie algebra with a representation, we can assign the Lie algebra representation to each of the uh, intersections of a chord with a strand and label all the, the, the chords themselves with a, with a metric. So you're using a metric Lie algebra. Then you have evaluated the whole thing as a Penrose diagram, Penrose diagram notation to a number. So this is what in ADS-CFT or in, uh, in, uh, D, uh, in D equals four super young wills would be known as a single trace operator labeled by by such a chord diagram gives you a number. Sorry, I'm just saying, so um, with Lie algebras and Lie algebra representations, you get quantum states or would be quantum states. You get linear functionals on these algebras of observables. And um, 
they look like um, like states of fuzzy spheres if you take the Lie algebra to be SO two, and it uh, it reflects the the expected funny uh, fuzzy funnels between that reflect these um, these de Bray intersections. And anyway, then you can prove I'm really getting ahead of myself, you know. Then you can prove that uh, that some of these quantum some of these linear functions are actually actually quantum states. It's kind of a no ghost theorem for these quantum states, in that uh, they are actually positive as linear functions. That's that's a result we had with uh, David Corfield and Hisham Sati. So, so this goes to show that beyond the kind of on the nose brain charge quantization that one sees, there's a whole lot of um, kind of deeper structure of M theory, of the M theory folklore of expected structure that actually follows from this hypothesis age, which suggests that it, it sees actually um, maybe quite a bit of the previously elusive M theory. Yeah, that's what I have to say here. Is there another question, maybe? Oh, I wanted to say something about onions, did I? So one can, since since you had this, uh, I heard that you heard something about quantum computation. You can do the same thing now with uh, D4 and S5 intersections. These are, in M theory, these are actually M5, M5 intersection of quarter dimension two. So previously we had quarter dimension three, now it's quarter dimension two. And so we now get the configuration space of points in in the plane. Oh, this is a type where this has to be a C1, just in the plane. And, and this is interesting because, because kind of doing the analogous argument for the D68 case now gives us the, um, the homology algebra of the loop space of, again, the typo, it's copy and paste typo, of the loop space of the configuration space, but points in, uh, Conversion space of points in the plane is actually a, a classifying space of the braid group. The, the moving around of these points in the plane are braids. This actually co completely characterizes this space. So actually hypothesis H predicts that defect brains like M5, M5 intersections um, intersecting on three-dimensional defects in one M5 actually satisfy you know, their states are now braid representations since they're onions and it satisfy actually anionic braiding. So this is something that one could see in the literature. There was uh, there was an article, uh, what's uh, the author's name again? I forget. Uh, there's an article, that, uh, a book sort of defect brains where at some point um, it says, well, it would seem plausible that defect brains should should actually be onions realized in string theory. And, um, and But uh, as far as I know, there was no concrete argument for this within string theory. But if you work out these con consequences of hypothesis H actually follows. And um, and that's that's what that's what really led us to have the center for quantum and topological systems, because the idea was that uh, to make use of this now in the context of topological quantum computation uh, by having you know, kind of a holographic realization of um, of onions now in the sense of a brain brain realization. But this maybe needs to be worked out further. But anyway, that, that would be another another one of the consequences of hypothesis age, um, which uh, which we have derived.